Hey, I just want to share with you just a little bit about God's great power through love. It is an interesting time in my life. Um, I'm glad that, that I could be here tonight. Uh, I love youth camp. Uh, no matter how old I get, I will always love youth camp. Um, it's a, it is a great place to be. And I've been a part of this youth camp since 1997. And, uh, and so I have been on call, though, waiting, anticipating, as I shared with you on Sunday afternoon, um, but even more today, because my daughter's due date for her baby is today. And so I've been waiting, and uh, I got a text earlier, and it said, um, my daughter's name is Hannah, and it said from my wife, Hannah's not feeling well. Um, you know, just pray for her. And I'm like, so is this the beginning? Do I, or am I coming home or am I not coming home? And uh, Pastor Drew um, is speaking tomorrow night. And I, I said, listen, if I have to go, we're flip-flopping. You're coming. You're speaking uh, when I need to. And then I'll, I'll flip to your time. And he said, okay. And so he has been waiting in the wings. But in the process, I, I looked at him and I said, I hope I don't have to go yet. And he goes, so do I. I want you to speak tonight, and I'd rather speak tomorrow night and, and, and go with it. And so, folks, I tell you, I have my cell phone right here. If it vibrates, my goal is not to touch it. Um, my daughter, I figure she can wait just a little longer. Um, she can hold that child in there. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I can put, her, put, put me on the cell phone and go, just hold that baby in there until I get there. And... Uh, She'll probably say, and scream, I can't! And I'll say, well, I'll get there when I can. Folks, I'll tell you, God's power is amazing. God's power is amazing. I'm telling you, through my years of ministry, I have been able to see God's power and through his love of reaching and touching people. This is kind of like a little reunion for me. Um, we have um, Pastor Justin, who, uh, who was a youth at youth camp in western Pennsylvania when I was a district youth president out in western Pennsylvania uh, a few years ago. And uh, Brad, Pastor Brad up here, who uh, he was not quite a teenager when I was out there in western Pennsylvania, he was on the verge of becoming a teenager when I left. I knew what, what was coming. And, uh, and so I, I got out of there before he could become a teenager. Uh, no, I'm just joking, Pastor Brad. And then his brother is here. His brother Brian is here, and, and it's a reunion. He was part of the youth when I was there at his church. And, uh, and so I needed a little technology help um, tonight. And uh, I sat down at the computer out here, and I said, how do I get this printer to fit onto my computer? I'm not always tech savvy. And uh, Brian, Brad's busy doing stuff. Brian, he sends Brian. Brian comes down, does some different things, helps me to print out some stuff. And all of a sudden, Brian looks at me. He goes, wow, the last time I helped you on a computer, you had flying toasters on your screen. And I sat there and said, you know, I remember that. I remember the goofy little flying toasters on a, on a screen. And I said, okay, that just really dates me and I'm old now. Thank you. <laughs> was it what? Uh, it, was the one that we, it was the one that we cranked the squirrel and uh, it got the rolling. No, folks, I'll tell you, just the power of watching God work in people's lives over the years. You stand back in awe of what God is doing as he works in many different ways in people's lives. I want to take you back to the Old Testament because the Old Testament, uh, we kind of sometimes stay away from the Old Testament because we look at it and we say, okay, um, it's, it has the laws and, and different things. And, you know, we, we look at it and we say, I'm not sure if I grasp everything and it has creation and it has about the stories of Noah, and, and it has Moses, and it has, you know, the um, children of Israel, and it talks about Daniel, and it talks about David, and, and it continues through, and, and we go, they're, they're wonderful stories, and we kind of 
put that off to the side sometime, but, uh, but I want us to just stop and think that in the Old Testament, it shows a lot of God's power. God's power shows up in the burning bush when Moses is standing there talking. God's power shows up in the midst of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. God's power shows up in the midst of David slaying Goliath. God's power shows up in the middle of Daniel's life when Daniel is being persistent and consistent in praying to the Lord and there's other people in leadership of government around him that make the, makes the king write a decree that throws Daniel into the lion's den. But God's power showed up that Daniel get, gets thrown into the lion's den. I can imagine Daniel sitting down there just kind of petting the lions, naming them, relaxing, taking it easy. Because if you stop and think about Daniel, the king runs and says, Oh, Daniel, oh, Daniel, did your king save you? And he yells back, King, I'm okay. They pull Daniel out. They throw the ones who were deceivers in, and they were eaten like that. It's the power of God. You see story after story. You come into the New Testament, and you not only see God's power, but it is revealed even more through love. Jesus Christ was born as a little baby. He comes into a world, and we stop and think as a little baby is vulnerable. Everybody's looking for a king that is triumphant, coming as a warrior. And the true king comes as a little baby. That little baby grows up, spends time, reaches out to some we call it society misfits. It's kind of interesting. Uh, throughout this week, it, it, it's been kind of interesting, some of the things and, uh, that have taken place and everything. And, of course, we're all coming and we're all trying to get rooms and do different things and get our stuff in a room. And I get... You know, I help my group get in, and, and all of a sudden I come back and I say, I come back out here and I say, hey, what room am I in? And Josh looks at me, Pastor Josh looks at me, and he goes, you don't have a room. I said, what do you mean I don't have a room? He goes, you're not on the list. I said, are you serious? Well, okay, I'll sleep in the van or something. And so I go to Pastor Brad, and I'm like, hey, I'm not on the list. He goes, oh, man. Sorry about that. He comes down. Of course, Pastor Brad, he, he's the man who makes the calls. And he calls over. He goes, I need room 217. And uh, I said, okay, sweet. And so I go in there. And then later on, I hear that Ricky Murphy, as part of the worship band, they come to me and they say, hey, can Ricky come into your room? Because Ricky doesn't have a room. And I find out that Ricky wasn't on the list either. And Ricky says that our room is for the misfits. We just, we're lost out there. And I stop and I think in the midst of life, sitting in this room with about 270 teenagers, how many of you may stop and think, boy, you know, there's sometimes I feel like a misfit. I feel like I don't fit in. I feel like I'm lost. I feel like I'm walking around discouraged. I come to youth camp, I sing the songs, I know how to act, and so I kind of get by, and then I go back home and I'm right back where I was before. I have been praying, the leadership has been praying, that the Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts this week. See, our desire is not to be the same that we've always been. To not to be the same that we've always been. We don't want youth camp to be the same thing that we just come in and we do it. We get up here and...
be honest with you, you can tell who's the first timers and who's not the first timers. Uh, the people that have been here before, what do they do? Man, you know what? They all immaculately run up here. You know, they're all up here. Like, yeah, whoo, whoo. You know, and, and the first timers are like back there going, what in the world are they doing? Why did they do that? And so I stop and think, man, there's people that are even come here that go, man, I, do I really fit in? Can I tell you something? I watch something. I, I love to watch people. I tell my children never to stare at people, but I watch people. I love watching people. I love watching how they respond and what they do. And, and we're talking about walking in love. And so I'm watching different ones throughout this week. And I watch different ones step up to the understanding of walk in love. I was out carrying some hoses and, uh, for the ones who had to clean off and, and get some of that paint and that egg off. And, and I was pulling some hoses out with Pastor Josh and, and I was walking out there and I saw two guys. I saw um, Brandon and Bernard out there standing with some friends talking. And I walked over and said, do me a favor. Here you go. Take those hoses over to that barn, hook it up. And they're like, okay. And they went and they did that. And I thought, man, that is so cool. And they, then they spent time out there. They were willing to go the extra mile. There was another guy, his name is John, I believe. And he eventually came over to the hose, one hose, and he was helping, holding the hose and rinsing people off. And, and all of a sudden, no one was at the hose. And he looks at me and he goes, what else do you want me to do? And so there were some containers that Ambassador Brad brought over. And he set them down and they just started cleaning them out. I thought, man, that's pretty cool. There's a gentleman, and, and, and this is, I believe he's a counselor. He, uh, he helped one of the girls who has her leg, and I'm not talking about Emily, I know Emily, but she has her leg with a cast and she wants to be part of the paint uh, thing. And, and here she is after the game, she's rolling on the ground trying to get back to the pavement, I think. And her friend is pushing a wheelchair <laughs> on the grass and, and she's crawling and different things. They finally get her in the wheelchair. And, I believe Avery is the one who finally pulled her across the grass or in the wheelchair all the way to the pavement. Walk in love. I stop and think that in the midst of the Old Testament going into the New Testament, the power of God's love shows up in Jesus Christ and he shows us example after example how to live our lives. We have a tendency in our life to to look at people that do not know Jesus Christ and we look at them and they, we say, wow, you're a sinner and you're lost and sometimes we're condemning them and Jesus is loving them. It's a big difference. He loves them. I think of the story of the adulterous woman who was brought out by all the men of the town. They're ready to stone her. Jesus gets down into the sand. One of these days I'm going to ask Jesus, can you tell me what you were writing in the sand? I'd really like to know. There's a lot of assumption of what he was writing. You know, I don't think anybody really knows, but he was kind of dueling in the sand. And he says, he who is not sin cast the first stone. And one by one, they started dropping the stones and leaving. After a period of time, Jesus looks at the woman and says, where are they? And, he sa and she says, they've gone. And he looks at her and he says, I'm not condemning you either. And then he says, go and sin no more. Folks, I'll tell you, you talk about power and love. What an amazing, powerful sharing time that was between Jesus and that woman. 
Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. We say a phrase in our church, uh, I think every Sunday. If I don't say it, the people in our church, and some people in our church say, Pastor, you forgot to say it. But we say God is good, and some people say all the time. And then I say all the time, and they say, okay, so here we go. God is good all the time. God is good all the time. You want, I want to show you God's power and God's love. As leadership, we've communicated about where we want at youth camp to go, the next youth camp, and, and the theme, and, and discussing it. And, and we came through, you know, to the dynamics of walk in love. And our, in my church that I'm a part of, uh, it's, it's, it's mainly a traditional church. And so we get these bulletins, uh, very traditional, um, and we, we just buy them. They design the cover. They design everything except we put in the information in it. And they come to us, you know, a few good months out before we ever use them. And this past Sunday, the Sunday of youth camp starting, the church bulletin that we have, when I looked at it on Saturday night, when I was helping my wife fold the bulletins and she inserted them, at the top it says, walk in love. I looked at that, and I said, man, this is great. God, you are amazing, and you are a good God, because how many times do things happen like that? Now, see, I don't believe in coincidence. I don't believe things just happen. I believe that God designs and works in every single one of our lives. I don't believe in luck. I believe in Jesus. I don't put my hope in something that might happen, I put my hope in something that I know will happen. Because I know that Jesus will show up. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, it says it this way. So imitate God. And let me stop there. Let's go back to Pastor Tori and, and what she shared a little bit. If you want to imitate God, you have to first know him. And love him. You cannot imitate someone unless you really love them and know them. You got to get to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And folks, I'm telling you, you don't always have to know everything about him to know him. Because to be honest with you, where's Pastor Justin? Is he in the, is he in the room? He is not in the room. You know what? I've known him for about 10 years. But I don't, I don't know everything about him. But I know him. I know him well enough that I can say, Pastor Justin is a friend of mine. But I don't know everything about him. I don't know the intrinsic of his life and everything that is going on. But folks, I'll tell you, I can know Jesus. And so, imitate God. Now, my father is about my height, maybe just a little taller. And he's been a truck driver for about 45 years of his life. I found out he's 79 years old or 78 years old. And I found out that as I was a young guy, walking out from my house to the bus when I was going to school, I lived across the field from my grandparents and my great-grandparents, and my great-grandmother would watch me every single day walk out to the bus. Don't ask me why. But she would wa watch me every single day. And at different times when I would go over, she'd look at me and she goes, Greg, I just want to tell you, you walk just like your father. I'm like, what? She goes, you walk just like your father. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't watch. I don't stand there and go, okay, behind my dad and go, hmm, I wonder how he walked. Hmm, does he start out with his right foot or his left foot? I don't pay attention. It's just something that comes natural. Folks, to imitate God, you have to get to a point of it becoming so natural that you're following him and trusting him and loving him and serving him. 2009, there was a youth convention in Baltimore. I was just talking to Scott Simmons back there. 
I kind of told him that I believe probably 2009, I have been to youth conventions after youth conventions after youth conventions. I've traveled with teenagers. I enjoy youth conventions. I love youth conventions. But 2009 in Baltimore was probably one of the best youth conventions I was ever a part of. It was the most practical. Ricky Murphy was part of our, our, our group that uh, went and, uh, where is Ricky in here? Ricky, come here real quick, man. Hurry up. Faster than that. I can't hardly see you, but I know you were moving slow. Yeah, not that fast. Okay. Um, Ricky, you can come up here real quick. Ricky, man, I, I, I'll tell you, God has gifted Ricky, and um, thank you. Um, okay, if you want to sit, sit. No. Uh, God, God has gifted Ricky in many different ways through music, but in 2009, Baltimore uh, Youth Convention, it was a practical youth convention. It was talking about serve, to serve people. And so ahead of time, they tried to prepare you of things that you could do. And so our youth group, we went into Baltimore. We, t we were taking cans of soda and everything. We went out one afternoon. We went to a McDonald's, and we bought um, uh, burgers out of McDonald's. I don't know how many. And uh, we started walking the streets of Baltimore, handing out food and drink. We didn't really care whether they were homeless or not. We were out there to pray with whoever. And, and so the teens, they were like, oh, we're like, okay, here's what you need to do. We're going to go up to people. Now, of course, not all of us are going to go up to the same person because that will scare them. And we'll have people running from us. And, and so we're going to break off. And they're like, well, I don't know what I'm doing. I said, okay, well, let's all walk up to the first one, and I'll show you. And so we walked up to this guy, you know, automatically what are we doing we're looking at them and we're kind of seeing you know what they 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 look a little homeless you know look a little raggedy you know whether they're not or not you know they are or not and we walked up to this person and i said listen we just want to let you know that we're here in, in baltimore we're at a youth convention and uh, we have a, a sandwich and we have a drink for you and we would also like to pray with you would you allow us to do that and the gentleman he freely took the sandwich and he freely took the drink um, I think he opened up a bag, and there were about 10 sandwiches in there. And, uh, and then we prayed with him. After that, the teen said, okay, we're breaking off, and uh, we're okay. And the rest of the day, I followed. I kind of kick-started them, but then I followed the rest of the day. Towards the end of the time that we were out there, there was a gentleman in a wheelchair. Ricky and another young lady see this young man in a wheelchair and they're like you know what man we want to give him something we want to give him something ricky and this girl will start running down the street after this gentleman in a wheelchair the gentleman in a wheelchair kicks in another gear to get away from them <laughs> he's looking back seeing ricky run after him he's like mm -hmm. he can't go fast enough ricky like catches them and, and, and you know I don't know how many of you, I, I've, I've seen mall cops and uh, um, Paul Ballard, you know, how he gets that older gentleman, stops him in the mall and says, hey, sir, and then next thing you know, he's laid stretched out on the floor holding on to the wheelchair. That's kind of like Ricky was in, in the city of Baltimore. And, uh, no, not really. I just, <laughs> sounded good. And, uh, but, but Ricky goes up to him and this other girl, um, part of our group, go up to him and they're like, man, you know what, we, we just want to give you some, uh, some food. And uh, he kind of he hesitated. And, and, and didn't really want it. And they're like, oh, no, no, you know, and we just want to give it to you and stuff and, and just, you know, encourage you along the way. And then he started asking Ricky questions. He said, you know, I believe another group was uh, talking about a, a service in here. And Ricky goes, yeah, it starts at 7 o'clock. It's right inside the motel at the convention area. You know what, why don't you come? And he goes, well, I don't know. They'll let me in. He goes, oh, you know what? It'd be great if you come. And, and then they walked away. They came back to us. We all watched this, and they came back to us. And uh, Ricky goes, you know what, Pastor Greg, I hope the guy comes. I really do. So we went in. We sat down as a group into the convention area. And uh, Ricky and myself, we kept watching the door just to see if the man would come. And the man showed up. He comes stro coming riding in on his wheelchair. I didn't go over to the man on the street. But as he stops his wheelchair, 
remote wheelchair on the side of the wall. He gets a blanket out, and he goes, and he, he, he kind of gets it out and puts it on the floor, and then he goes, and he helps himself down, and I look, and I realize he has no legs. And he sits down on the floor. And I look at Ricky, and I said, you know what? Let's go on over there. No one else got near him. They didn't know who he was. And we walked over, and to be honest with you, I, I think I sat down on his blanket nearby him. And we talked for a little bit. And we just said, you know, we're, we're glad you're com- you came, and, you know, we, we, we're praying for you. And then we left, and we went, and we eventually sat down. That night, as we were going through the service, the service took a turn. I knew what we were going to do as a leader. The teens didn't know what was going to happen at the end. That night, we were having a foot washing service. The man has no legs. Shortly before that service ended, I looked over and he was gone. And I stopped and I thought, if he would have stuck around, I wonder what would have went through his mind. And then in my heart and mind, I thought, the power of God's love. I would have probably, if I could have, but I didn't have the opportunity, I would have walked over to him and said, listen, I see you have no feet, but can I wash your hands? See, the power of God's love breaks all kinds of barriers. And we start looking at ways that we can reach out and communicate the gospel message. If it wasn't for Ricky and the other teenager at the time, that gentleman probably wouldn't have came into the youth convention. And so, Ricky, thank you for chasing the man down. I'm glad you didn't run him over. (laughs) Folks, give Ricky a big hand, man. The scripture says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you're his his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. Folks, the power of God's love is deep and wide in the midst of life. He's an amazing God. He can do all kinds of things in life. You know, I say I'm waiting for my first grandchild to be born. And people ask me, are you excited? Are you excited? And I look at them and go, yeah, I am. And they go, man, you don't seem to be excited. And then I tell this story. I had two nieces that were both pregnant at the beginning of this year. One was due before my daughter, and one was due after my daughter, and they both lost their babies. And so I said, you know, I just take them one day at a time. But now since today is the day, I'm kind of like anticipation. I'm kind of waiting for the moment. And I stop and think that even though The Lord allows my first grandchild to be born. Folks, I tell you, that's not the greatest thing of my life. I can stand here and say, man, I miss my wife. My wife is usually here with me, um, but she's home, and uh, she's there kind of being the closest one to our daughter, and uh, and she is waiting in anticipation. I'd like to stand here and say, you know what, the day I got married, 27 years ago was the greatest day of my life, but it wasn't. The greatest day in my life was at a camp in Eastern Shore, Maryland, Denton Camp. My wife, not at that time because she was a teenager, was going to youth camp. I wasn't going to youth camp. I was working. 
but I went every night. And on Thursday night of youth camp, these guys grabbed hold of my heart, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And I haven't looked back. That's the greatest day of my life. The power of God's love. Let me go just a little further back in my life. I can stand here today at 52 years old and say there were some things that I was a part of and that I did back when I was a teenager that probably it's not a great thing, and I know it wasn't a great thing, but it's something that I walked through in life. And I had a mother who loved me. I'm a mama's boy. I love my mama. My mom found out some things that I was doing and she stopped me and she talked to me and she said these words, Greg at this point we're kind of old enough that we can't really tell you what to do but I want to let you know if you ever need us we're there and I love you. that moment when my mom looked at me and said I love you that broke my heart and I looked at what I was doing in life and I said why do I do the stuff that I'm doing and it breaks the heart of the one person that I truly know that loves me and that's my mom why would I ever do that My mom passed away about three years ago. I had the opportunity of spending time with her the last week of her life. Spent time with her, my two sisters, my dad. Every day, my, my two sisters and I, we'd go into the room and we, came, we became little children again. My mom was basically out. She wasn't looking at anybody. She was there. They say the last thing that goes is your hearing. We became like little children. We laughed. We messed around. We had fun. My oldest sister, she was the whiner. She's like, Mom, they're picking on me. Can you hear them? They're picking on me. My second oldest sister, she was just annoying. She was, the, she was the one that picked on everybody. I was the good one. I was the youngest. I was probably the youngest one. But I'm telling you, at that moment, I can picture my mom laying there. She wasn't communicating. She couldn't communicate. But I can picture her hearing her in her mind going, that's my family. I love them. Folks, I tell you, there are things that you probably are doing in your life that you know you don't need to be a part of. Can I ask you a question? Why do you continue to do the things you shouldn't do and hurt the one who truly loves you? And I'm not talking about your mother and I'm not talking about your father or your aunt or your uncle or anybody else, what I, who I'm talking about is Jesus Christ. He's the one who truly loves you. He's the one who has given his life that you may have life. He is the one who desires to touch your life that you may have life abundantly. He's the one who desires to free you of anything that you're working through, any struggles that you have. He's the one who desires to free you the question is, do you want to be free? Do you want to be free? Let me ask the question to you, and I want you to respond. How many people want to be free? Just raise your hand. 
How many people want to be free? I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what's going on or taking place in your life. But folks, I'm telling you, I love being free. I love being free. I love being the child of Jesus Christ. I love, as as people, as my great-grandmother used to say, you walk like your father. I've told people that story, and I'm going to tell you right now, I love my father. I love my earthly father, but I'd rather walk like my heavenly father. That when people look at me, they would say, I just want to let you know, man, you act just like your heavenly father. Because as I live my life, I want people to see Jesus. I don't want them to see me. I want them to see Jesus. I want them to get to the point of loving Jesus and knowing who Jesus Christ truly is. That one day that people could could say, listen, I love the Lord with all my heart, my soul. I love him with everything. And I desire to follow him and imitate him. Because he wants us to follow him and to love others. It's an interesting thought about love. We have ruined that word so much in our society, in our world. There are some people who love cats here. Folks, I don't know why God created cats. You know, we have a stray cat around our house. We don't feed that thing. That thing keeps showing up. We have a porch swing. That cat is strange. If we put the cushion down on the porch swing, some nights we'll turn the light on and the cat's sitting on the cushion and my wife goes, oh, it's sitting on my cushion. We flip that cushion up and that cat doesn't sit on that porch swing. I'm like, you know, I'd like to just get rid of that cat somehow. But we have a lady in our church that loves cats. Oh, man. She has cats crawling all over. You call her and talk to her, and all of a sudden, she's having a conversation with her cat while you're on the phone with her. I'm like, man, I called you to talk to you. What in the world are you having a conversation with your cat for? And we don't feed this cat. And I'm thinking, you know, cat, you want to catch mice? That's great. Catch all the mice you want, but, you know, go get fed by somebody else. And so this cat, one morning, my wife's walking out and getting ready to take her her daughter to school and and to work. And she walks out and she goes, Greg, come here. I said, what? You know, that cat brought a mouse and laid it right on the front of our house, you know, right there, right when we walk out. And I'm like, oh, that's a wonderful gift. I'm thinking, man. I definitely don't love cats. <laughs> but it shows up every so often. And I stop and think, that's some of us with Jesus. We're like, you know, I love Jesus, and, and I'll show up every so often, but, but Lord, you know, you're wonderful, and you're fantastic, and you help, out, help me out every so often. To imitate God, it has to be 24-7. Not I just when I want to, but every single day. Let me share with you a story here. It's a story about a man. His name is John Griffith. John was the father of the eight-year-old son. John was a conductor of a, of a bridge. He would go and over the Mississippi River. He would go and raise the bridge for the boats go through the Mississippi River and he'd lower the bridge so the train could come across and travel through. His eight-year-old son loved what his dad was doing. It's all about trains. He loved to hear about his dad's job and work. And he always wanted to go with his dad to work. And, and his father just would most of the time say, no, you, you got to stay home. No, you can't go with me. And so his son kind of just kept on him Dad, can I go? Can I go? And, and finally his father said, okay, you can come with me. And so they took their lunch with them, and, and it was about lunchtime. And so they went off to the side, and they sat on this little hill, and they were eating lunch. And all of a sudden John looked at his watch and noticed that there was going to be a train coming. The bridge is up. There was going to be a train coming with about 300 passengers. 
and they need to go and lower the bridge. And so he didn't want to kind of startle his son, and he said, son, tapped him on the head. He said, you just stay here. He said, dad will be back shortly. And so John went and climbed the steps and went into a, a little uh, box area, and, and he started lowering the bridge. And all of a sudden he noticed, he looked over and he noticed that his son had left the spot where he left him. And all of a sudden he looks down to the bottom of the bridge area and he noticed that his eight-year-old son had tried to come up to where he was, but he slipped and got caught in the gears of the bridge. And John stood there, he looked, and he could see the train starting to come with 300 passengers. And he looked down at his son. And he tried to figure out if he had enough time to go down and grab his son. And he realized he had no time to get down there. It was either sacrifice his son or rush and keep 300 people safe. It was one or the other. It couldn't be both. And so he lowered the bridge on his son. The train started coming by. John looks at the people. He sees one man reading a newspaper. He, says, uh, he sees another gentleman talking to his wife. He sees a woman drinking tea. They're oblivious to what just has occurred. And John stands there, and at the top of his lungs, he goes, Don't you know what I just did for you? Nobody heard him. Once again, he said, I said, don't you know what I just did for you? And the train went by. No one ever knowing. No one ever paying attention to what John just sacrificed. His son. There's many people in this world today that have never paid attention to the sacrifice that God gave his one and only son to die on the cross. Not just for us that are in this auditorium, but for every single person. It's the power of God's love for every single person. And that power is deep and strong. I'm telling you, I don't know what you deal with. I don't know what occurs in your life. I don't know what's taking place. But I know that there's people that are bound by different chains in life. There's people that are bound by different addictions. There's people that are lost they're caught up in areas of life that they don't even need to be a part of. And they're looking for ways to get out. They just don't know. They haven't heard God say, don't you know what I just did for you? And folks, I'm telling you, they want, to be, they want their chains to be broken. I don't know for you, even if you're, you know, that you're here tonight, that you're going, man, there, there are some things that, man, I, that have a hold of me, and, and I would love those chains to be broken. Can I tell you something? The power of God can break the chains, and you can be free. Amen? Amen. The power of God's love can break the chains and you can be free. So, let me ask you again. How many people want to be free? Put down your hands. Let me ask this question. 
How many people are tired of being chained to whatever it is you're dealing with? Let the power of God's love break the chains. Why do you keep putting up with it? Why do you keep hurting the one that loves you the most? Why do you keep doing the same thing over again when Jesus Christ says, I love you this much? I gave my life that you may have life and life abundantly. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on out here, to come on up. Folks, here, here's what I like to do tonight. I would just like right now if there's people here that would say, man, I'm tired of the bondage. I'm tired of the chains. I'm tired of, of what I'm dealing with. I'm tired of it. I'm frustrated with it. I've dealt with it. I've tried to take care of it. I've tried to work it out, and it just seems like I can't work it out anymore. We can't do it on our own. That's why we need the power of God's love to work through our situation, our circumstances, to get us to where we need to be. Here's what I'm asking. And I want you to really think about this. And I want you to think about it before you even do anything in response. I don't want this to be kind of a haphazard decision of, oh, I'm just going to stand because everybody else is, or I'm going to stand without ever thinking. Are there anybody here tonight that would say, you know what? I don't want the chains to be around me anymore. I'm tired of them. They drag me down. They're heavy. They hurt. And I desire to be free through the power of God's love. If that is you, I want you to stand. God's love not only wants to work in your life, but to work in other people's lives. And if we are holding on to the chains, and we're allowing the chains to hold on to us, it is hard to imitate God and to follow Him and to love others when we have all this holding us down. I might be 52 years old and overweight and out of shape, but I will tell you this. I desire to run free in my relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't want any chains to trip me up. I don't want any chains to hold me back. I don't want anything to cause me any struggles as I live for the Lord and love the Lord. Because folks, I want to love others with the power of God's love. I want to serve Him. I want to follow Him. And I pray tonight that your desire to give it all to Him. We're supposed to be imitators can't imitate someone fully unless you're free. Allow God's power, His power, and His love to flow into your life and to make you the person 
he sees you to be. Let him work and move in your lives. Lord, we come before you. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help each and every single one of us. May we understand the sacrifice of Jesus Christ you paid for us. May we understand the power that you have over Satan and sin and every single thing in our life. May we be willing and desire to give it all to you. And may we be free from the chains and may we live a life pleasing to, for you. And Lord, may we walk in your presence. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your love. Thank you for not beating us down further when we've been down. But Lord, thank you for loving us to bring us up. And to help us stand. And to help us to run. And help us to live in freedom not to do whatever we want to do, but in freedom of loving you and living for you every single day. Lord, we thank you. And we praise you. And we give you the glory. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen.